And then I, I guess one other thing that I should touch on before we, we come to a close, I, I think the biggest, since we've started sharing video and pictures of this V3 pan, one of the, the most common comments is related to, to oil temperature. Mm. Uh, and, and so the answer is we, we don't know. And, and that's why we're, we're testing. The, the pan is extremely close to the stock header. Uh, it's likely that there's going to be some increase of heat transfer from the header to the pan. The pan's also like nominally 3.5 millimeters thick. So it's, it is a pretty thick pan. It's not, it's not thin like the stamp steel factory one. Um, but that's the purpose of the testing. So if we find that oil temperature is increasing due to the pan at a rate that's not acceptable, we can, we can revisit that. But um, I think the point to drive home is that our approach was simplicity, um, get the oil pressure under control. Oil temperature is something that can be addressed. And on a more serious track car probably needs to be addressed regardless of the oil pan. So let's get the oil pressure under control and then we can worry about temperatures as, as like a, a secondary, a secondary issue. And yeah, so the, the goal was to get as much oil in there as possible and just see what happens. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, what you've been doing is what I've been seeing from the people that are testing is you're putting the gold reflective heat reflective tape between the pan and the headers yeah. because yes, you're, you're trying to use all of the available space, which goes right up to the factory header, yeah. but that, that reflective uh, tape does do a pretty good job uh, reflecting radiant heat energy. Yeah. Um, the other point is that there is definitely a correlation between oil temperature and oil pressure. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we, you know, we're talking about with our Pikes Peak cars, as we saw our oil temperatures peak, our oil pressures really started to decline. Yeah. You guys are seeing overall increases in oil pressure. That definitely indicates that like as, as close as it is to the headers, whatever initial preliminary heat management you guys are doing, you're still getting that increase in pressure. So over over what you were what you would see with the stock pan in the same problem areas. So even if the oil is getting a bit hotter, there's still an overall net gain. And yeah. you know, once you know what the final design is, there's all sorts of crazy heat management things you could you could put into place, like you know, if it's a cast pan, maybe even ceramic coating it. You know, or, or you know, if the reflective heat tape is enough, I mean, that's easy to apply, easy to reapply. There's 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 a lot of there's a lot of thermal options available, even if the pan is close to the header. Yeah, and the the factory header was something that was really important to us for for customers that can't or aren't willing to um, sort of violate the the EPA rules. Yeah. Um, the 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 stock header is actually a lot more space constraining than some of the aftermarket options. So yeah, the, that was kind of our, our volume goal was to be able to fit with the stock one, get it as close yeah. as possible and, and ensure that we aren't introducing any unintentional heat management issues, but yeah. you know, that's, and, that's why we're going to keep testing. And just to clarify the why, at this point, I think especially people that have been following us on our channel will probably be aware of this, but there's a there's a catalytic converter that's incorporated into the factory header. And so in California and other states, some states like Colorado, that you cannot touch that. That is off limits. So if you would develop a pan that requires an aftermarket header, then it would only be something that could be run on a track car, something like that. So making sure that the pan is com is able to be fit with the factory header, then you don't run into any of those compliance issues. And then anybody that has a car, it's an option. It, you don't have to you know, take extra risks or jump through extra hoops just to get the pan to fit. Yeah, yeah. a couple, couple other things. So on my version of the pan v, on V2, the one that's in my car, um, I, didn't, I didn't observe any uh, temperature differences really on the street or on the track. Um, so we kind of know that as a, it, it does still get much closer to the header, not as close as uh, V3, but close enough where we had to remove the heat shield um, from the header on my car as well. Um, and uh, I do have an 
oil cooler on my uh, on my car, but it was effectively you know no difference. And there's two kind of uh, styles of driving that you want to consider uh, when you're thinking about heat, and they're they're pretty distinct. So one is sitting in traffic, commuting for dual purpose cars, um, and we we would like this to work for for those scenarios. Um, my car, uh, I actually run like a blocker to cover the oil cooler because otherwise my temperatures get too low on the street. If I'm just driving around or on the freeway, um, they can get down to, you know, 160 or 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So I actually block my uh, cooler core in order to increase the temperatures to around 200 degrees. So it's more similar to what, um, you know, I want to get the viscosity closer to what the OEM recommendation is. And so I'm effectively um, uh, handicapping my my cooling system in order to do that. Um, so I think, I think a lot of people don't um, don't consider how infrequently they get their oil up to the correct operating temperature in sort of shorter city driving, daily driving type type scenarios. So. And, and even just street driving, you might get it up to operating temperature. Like if you're driving on the highway for a prolonged period of time, you'll get it up there. But then you come off the highway and it's going to cool down because like like stop and go traffic, that's really not that thermally intensive unless you're like in like, I don't know, Death Valley in 120 degrees because there's just, you know, once once the engine isn't spinning, you're not you're not really heating it up as much and it will the oil will cool off. Yeah. So that, that's kind of like scenario one, and we're going to have data and be able to report on that data and show how the pan's doing. And then scenario two is on track where you have a lot of airflow. Your My cooler core is, is uncovered. So um, the last track day got up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit at Sonoma with my pan and my max temperature um, with my cooling setup was around 230 degrees Fahrenheit, which is great. That's you know, fine. I'm very happy with that. Um, so the... The track day that we're going to be going to on September 1st, where uh, we're going to have three of these pans um, in testing. Um, it's also expected to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so it'll be a really great um, data point for how does this do in a, in a pretty extreme uh, environment. Um, you know, you have 100 degrees ambient and then you have radiant heat from the track surface as well. So it's going to be dealing with a lot of heat. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how they perform. Yeah, and it's and again, you guys are doing the testing. This is not just something where you guys have thrown it into CAD, kind of gave it gave it a look and like, this looks like it'll fix it. And then then everybody's now trying to bolt it on the engine. You guys are doing all of this testing so that you guys are going to know, pretty much at this at the time that this pan becomes available, all all the circumstances that somebody could probably put their car this this pan and etc through and you're going to have a good data set of of what common results are you're going to know that it's it's going to work before it goes out that's why you're doing all this testing yeah um, i would definitely say this is like an abnormal amount of rigor um, for an aftermarket solution so well, um it, yeah. it is but it shouldn't be because yeah. this is i mean yeah it's it's going to be a known quantity once it's available and that's what that's what we all want it's just we get impatient and we forget that no, you guys need to do the work and we need to support you guys as you're doing your work so that when we get the pan, it works as advertised, we get the result that we want. Um, and, and just just to your point, Matt, and, and, and that I would I would hit home at this point is thermal management is one of those things that is it is really easy to kind of look at a thing and, and get an idea of what you think is going to happen and overreact. I think I, a lot of people like just for the exact reason you described. Well, the header's really close to the pan, so obviously the oil is gonna get like completely burned up and nuked because it's it's too close to the pan. You guys have done a lot of testing already and you're gonna continue to do more testing and that's not what's actually happening. So like it's I I see it it's very easy for people to kind of just look at a thing and think about what what might happen and decide, well, I need to fix this because this is what could happen, but it but it doesn't. And and you guys are doing the testing to ensure that once this pan comes to market, you're going to have confidence that even on a hundred degree track day, it you're going to have temperatures that are in an acceptable range, et cetera. Yeah, so. and the V3 pan is is a lot closer in a lot more areas than the V2 pan is. So it's like it's totally understandable that people have have concerns. Yeah, but that's that's what that's where the testing comes in, yeah. and like we talked about, there's options, and you guys are going to know what the good options are or what what you need to do to keep the temperatures in 
in an acceptable range once the pan comes out. Yeah. So we just need to let you guys do the testing and do your jobs and then trust that when we get the pan, it's going to work well. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Good points. And, and good, good for bringing that up at the end of your batch. So appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in. To hear the whole conversation, click below for the full episode of this podcast or tune in every week on iTunes or Spotify. If you like these episodes, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel because your support is what makes all of this possible. As always, this show is brought to you by Flatirons Tuning, your premier source for any Subaru, OEM, or aftermarket parts. Check out our website at flatironstuning.com, and as always, stay tuned with Flatirons Tuning.